You're listening to episode 68, How Travel Can Help Us Heal from Trauma, with Leanna Johnson. Welcome to the Grass Gets Greener podcast, the show for survivors by survivors. I'm your host, Melissa Wilson, a bullying survivor and anti-bullying advocate. And each week, you'll hear from a survivor who has overcome a traumatic experience to go on to not only survive, but thrive, so that you can too, starting now. Hey there, welcome to this episode. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so happy to have you here, as always. And happy spring, at least if you're listening to this, the day it's gone live. Yesterday was the first day of spring, which is always a great day, I think. So I hope that helps to bring a little smile to your face, especially if you live somewhere where you get bad winters. Then I hope that that will be coming to an end for you soon, if it hasn't yet. And you'll be getting some nicer weather with lots of sunshine. All right, so before we get into today's episode, I just want to mention that today's episode is brought to you by Audible.com. Audible is the premier provider of digital audiobooks. I signed up with them to get you a free audiobook download along with a 30-day free trial. They have over 180,000 titles, including some that have been mentioned on this show in the past, that you can choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or whatever you use as an MP3 player. So if this is something that interests you and you want to check it out, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible, and you can go ahead and get your free audio download along with that 30-day free trial. So today we're going to be joined by Leanna Johnson of lostlass.com. We're going to be talking mainly today about PTSD, travel, and growing up as a multicultural kid. Leanna is going to share with us about an incident that happened to her a few years ago and how she ended up experiencing delayed onset PTSD from that. Some of the other things that we're going to get into in this episode is what it was like for Leanna to go to school for the first time in the 11th grade after having been homeschooled up until that point as a result of her upbringing as a multicultural kid and not living in one place. She's going to talk about how getting into a relationship triggered her PTSD. We're going to talk about the gift of travel. We're going to talk about accepting the things that we can't control and how travel teaches us to do this. Leanna is also going to share about how getting pregnant has impacted her PTSD. And we're also going to stress the importance of getting help when you've been through something traumatic so that you're not keeping it all to yourself and trying to deal with it yourself, or even if you don't feel like you need help at that moment, the importance of of doing that. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get into this one, and I'm going to bring Leanna on. Leanna, welcome to the podcast, and thank you for joining me here to share your story with us. Thank you for having me, Melissa. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm happy to have you here. And... So just like my uh, guest on the previous episode, you and I got introduced through Andrew O'Brien. And as I was looking through your story, I found it really interesting because you have a different perspective on things because you're a, a multicultural kid who grew up globally and not just in one place or in one culture, like most of us do. And as a result of that, I know that travel is a big part of your life and it's even helped you to recently deal with PTSD that you have from an incident that I'll let you tell us about. Plus, you're also a journalist who has interviewed others who suffer from PTSD. So I'm definitely interested in hearing about your story and the work that you do today and just your unique perspective on it all. So Leanna, what I like to do here is just kind of start with your story so that we know where you're coming from. Now, I know that you say you didn't really have uh, anything traumatic happen to you uh, growing up up until a few years ago, but I would still love to hear, and I think the audience would as well, 
about your life growing up since I know that it has shaped you into the person you are today. So would you mind just starting us out there and taking us through that a little bit? Not at all. I'd love to share that. Um, I do Great. think I do think that um, growing up in different cultures can be a little bit traumatic in its own way because <laughs> you do kind of, you have to shift gears pretty abruptly as you go from place to place. And it can be, it can be a pretty severe adjustment. Um, but I, yeah. I was lucky, I think, uh, because I, I pretty consistently went back to the same places. I wasn't, uh, I, I wasn't, say, a diplomat's kid who would, who would jump from country to country every year or so. Um, I, uh, my uh, grandparents, and uh, for a couple generations back, were missionaries in southern Africa. And around, um, they went from Tanzania, they went to Angola, they ended up in Zimbabwe, uh, in Marandera, which is uh, close to Harare. And I would, um, when I was growing up, I would go visit them. Um, usually it was uh, once, once every two years, we would spend three or four months in Zimbabwe. And uh, it was me and my two sisters, we were homeschooled, so that made travel a little less complicated. And we would uh, we'd basically live with them for about three or four months. And uh, when we weren't in Africa, we were visiting uh, my my mom's other family in Britain, in uh, Scotland or England. We would we would sort of hop back and forth between the two countries. Sometimes we went to Wales. And uh, my my dad's family was from Texas, so we had a bit of a sort of American British African kind of mix there. We would sort of rotate where we ended up. Mm -hmm. And where were you born? I was born in the States, in Atlanta. Okay. Um, all, all three of us were born in the States. But um, and my, first trip to, my first trip to Africa was, I think I was a year old or maybe 18 months, but it was pretty, I was pretty young. I, I definitely don't remember it, but I've got the pictures and um, I have a lot of, a lot of memories sort of growing up with um, my cousins in Scotland, with um, lots of lots of children, uh, the village children in Africa, and um, family in, in Texas as well. So it's all kind of jumbled up between different accents and languages. And, and my family is also very multicultural, not just not just the places they chose to live in, but even even my Scottish cousins, they're spread all around Europe now. They've married people from Northern Africa, from Eastern Europe, from Asia. And so even when we get together in Scotland, it's like a mini United Nations. It's uh, it's a very lots of different accents, different faces, different cultures. And I've I've always loved that about my family. Mm. Did did growing up this way like cause you to struggle with your identity at all? It definitely, um, it definitely brings up a lot of complications. And I did actually end up writing uh, some articles about that as well, which was fun, kind of exploring life as a multicultural. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you kind of, you're, you're kind of forced to try and figure out where you belong, or at least you, you believe that you have to choose a place. And I ended up just, just, uh, trying to accept the fact that I would never belong to one specific place. I might, my accent may be mostly American, but um, if I, when I'm meeting new people or I'm talking to uh, say a cashier or a shopkeeper, my accent will be British. Um, I'm, I'm a bit of a chameleon. So it, my, my accent changes depending on who I'm talking to. If I'm talking to someone British I almost likely sound British. I and mean, if, if I'm talking to South African, I'll probably sound South African. And um, that's really interesting. <laughs> it just it just comes naturally. And even my family is a little put off by that because I could I could assimilate to any culture that I felt like. And it got a little interesting when I really became obsessed with Indian and Korean cultures growing up. I loved Bollywood, I loved the dancing, I loved the Korean dramas, the Asian dramas. And so my family wasn't really sure what to do when I had an Indian accent or I would pick up Hindi words or Korean words 
uh, they weren't really sure what to do with that. But it's just uh, it's just a part of my character, and it's it's really lent itself to my interest in culture in um, in journalism as well, because I'm fascinated by the media in different cultures, by how people communicate cross culturally. And um, I think I would say the the multicultural upbringing plus a love of writing is what really kind of led me to journalism. And of course, mm. the sort of personal, very personal identity crises that I went through growing up definitely, definitely uh, pushed me in that direction as well. Yeah, that's really interesting. So do you kind of identify yourself uh, with any one country right now? Or do you, do you kind of consider yourself like just a citizen of the world? I think I like I like that term citizen of the world. Um, I could I could technically classify myself as African American. Um, I was almost a dual citizen, but I, unfortunately, my parents did not file the paperwork in time, so I can't I can't exactly say that. But I would say that I don't I I do. Um, Although I live in the States, I don't really feel quite as home here as I do in uh, Britain. That's, mm. I would say that is where I most, I most identify myself is with, is, is in Britain. A lot of my academic and cultural interests lie in Asia and Africa. Um, but a lot of my relationships, a lot of my family connections, and of course my day-to-day -day existence is in the States. So I can't really deny that identity because whenever I travel, I do realize how American I am. Um, but I have, I have kind of learned to see myself as just an interesting mix of, of all three and, uh, just a multicultural, um, as you said, citizen of the world, global citizen, if you will. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you said you were homeschooled throughout your childhood? Yes, that's right. I was homeschooled until my junior year of high school. Oh, wow. Then you went to school at that point? Yes. I went to a, a private school close by for two years and then on to college. What was that like for you to, to go to, to school for the first time? And, and where was that here in the States? It was. It was in the States. Um, it was actually a relatively easy transition because the school I went to was, uh, I had done a, a Christian youth program, uh, theater. Uh, it's called CYT, Christian Youth Theater, for several years before I went to school. And they actually did all their performances at the school that I ended up enrolling in. So uh, the school was also connected to the church my family was at at the time. So it was relatively easy for me to transition because I knew a lot of the people there. I knew the space. Um, it was close to everything I was comfortable with. But I still, I still definitely had a reputation for being kind of the odd homeschool girl. I wore a lot of long dresses and had my nose stuck in a book most of the time. Uh, I made all of my own. Um, outfits for the dances and uh i kind of i hopped around to different groups of friends i didn't i didn't really s stick with any particular group or niche so it right. was a, it was it was a unique experience that's for sure <laughs> yeah well if probably if you had tried to go to to school before then it, it probably would have been a, a definite challenge like you said i mean at least by being homeschooled, you were allowed to to travel freely, um, but I, I imagine it would have been more difficult for you when you, when you were younger to try to, you know, integrate yourself into school systems at that point. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so then a few years ago, you had something traumatic happen to you, right? Hmm. Do you wanna do you wanna share that with us a little sure, bit? Sure. Yeah, I was. Um... So by that time, I was in college. I had been in community college for several years, and I decided to transfer to a four-year university downtown Chicago. So I lived uh, in Chicago for uh, about two, two, two and a half years. And I was working as a deckhand um, on the Chicago River at that particular point. That was my kind of fun side part-time job. And I was mugged on my way home uh, from work one night. 
and I lived uh, I lived just off of an alley, so I had to go into the alley to get to my to get to the door of my apartment or the uh, I lived on the second floor of an apartment building, and my private entrance was in, through the alley. So uh, looking back, probably should have stuck with the front entrance, maybe. But um, it, was, it wasn't really something I'd thought about. And I was just walking by myself. Um, I had a, I was reading a book. I don't, I'm not sure if I was reading a book or just holding it, but I had a book with me. And um, I was held up with, um, by a man with a gun. And he ended up taking um, some cash. He took my phone, I think. And um, he also almost tried to rape me. But thankfully, uh, because I had the book, which both of us had forgotten about in the heat of the moment, I was able to defend myself and get away. I tried to hit him in the face with the book. And uh, that kind of startled him because I had been kind of quiet and hadn't been saying much before. And I just kind of exploded out of nowhere and mm-hmm. he ended up hitting me in the face with the butt of his gun and running off. So cut to me, it was kind of this weird dramatic movie scene where I'm just kind of sitting on the floor of this alley, sort of stunned, and my face is bleeding because I have a black eye and uh, the gun had sort of cut into my cheek. And um, there's this there's this book in the dumpster from where I'd launched it. And uh, it was it was over pretty quickly. You know, the police came very quickly. My roommate helped me with my face and my family came by to pick me up. And I ended up missing school for a few days just to just to uh, take a break and stay with my family. Mm -hmm. But uh, life continued on relatively normally after that. It was it was just kind of a bizarre. It wasn't something that I thought about until until a bit later when the PTSD started kicking in. Yeah, and when was that? When did you start having the PTSD from it? It took about a year, which I, I'm, I'm not sure how common that is, but it was kind of a late onset PTSD. So I, I think I just kind of, I was very calm at first. I was very logical. I just kind of, Aside from sharing, you know, a picture of my black eye with my friends on Facebook, there wasn't really much. I I didn't really react to it much. And then I started about a year afterwards. I started um, having these dissociative episodes where I would try and kind of separate my personality into different pieces. I would sort of see myself as as, uh, a few different people. And... um, from what I've from what I've heard, that's a pre- that is um, one way of of uh, experiencing PTSD is you try to separate the incident from yourself. Mm. So that's what I did, and it sort of came out in my writing. I started writing. I started being really interested in multiple personalities, and I would write about it a lot in my creative nonfiction classes and writing groups. And it's uh, I was I was studying it as well, and. Um, uh, after that, it, thankfully, that that just kind of went away on its own. But it left sort of a fear of of a sort of a growing fear of of going places, of um, which was really at odds with my very independent traveling background and personality. I would mm-hmm. I would be very worried about biking by myself, about walking by myself. Um, I didn't have a car at the time, so I was I was using public transportation. So that became difficult, just going to work, going to class. I missed a lot of work during that period. And I became very afraid of strangers. To this day, I hate people walking behind me. I will always pause and let them go ahead of me. So that's something that's kind of kind of left over. Um, mm-hmm. Strangers uh, talking to me, that was difficult. Um uh, just going out at all for a while. I would, in my worst sort of my worst days, were um, having plans to go out and then kind of making excuses for myself, and then deciding that I was just kind of safer and more comfortable at home. And mm-hmm. yeah, that that was. Um, I think that was definitely a low point. And and when did this attack happen? It was. Uh, let me see. October eighth, two 
2000, 2012. Yeah. Okay. So, so about uh, three and a half years ago then? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, that those um, manifestations of PTSD, those were, you know, a little more concrete than just having this kind of is- is dissociative idea in my head. Uh, those those kind of melted away a little bit when I graduated college. I moved back home, which looking back was probably not the best idea, but I was broke. I had just graduated college. I didn't have really anywhere else to go. Um, so I moved back into my parents' house, and unfortunately we we were having a rather complicated family situation, so that did not make anything better. Um, so I became, um, quite depressed. Um, the PTSD took a little bit of a back, I was sort of on the back burner a little bit because I had to deal with my family in the day to day and, um, sort of a lot more depression as well. So the, I didn't, I didn't have to, I didn't see a cropping up of the, of those particular symptoms again until I left my parents' house and I started seeing my current boyfriend. And uh, one thing about PTSD that that a lot of you might relate to, especially if you've had a traumatic experience that evolves rape or assault, is that relationships can be tricky <laughs> hmm. with PTSD. And you kind of have to learn to trust people on a very... Um, a very intimate level again. Mm. So uh, when I started seeing my current boyfriend, I would have pretty severe panic attacks. Um, it was uh, it, it could anything could trigger it. It could be a word. It could be uh, an experience. It could be uh, something. Uh, just someone walking by, and I would I would hyperventilate, and I would start shaking. I would have flashbacks. Um, if I walked by a dark alley, especially with dumpsters in it, that would uh, that would trigger it as well. If someone told me a story about someone being mugged on the news, or if I saw a movie scene that had abuse in it, that would trigger hyperventilation. Um, so sometimes I would sometimes I would just deep breathe my way through it, and sometimes I would end up in my closet listening to Evanescence for a little while. So mm-hmm. it's um. And did your did your boyfriend uh, know why you were having these symptoms? Yeah, I ended up well after the first panic attack. I I felt like I should probably tell him exactly what was going on because it sort of happened out of nowhere. So I I let him into it, and he um, bless his heart, he's been a huge huge support. So uh, he he was very helpful with that. And yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah. It was it was quite a blessing. Mm. So what sorts of things have you done to help you with these symptoms from the PTSD? You know, how how do you how do you cope with the flashbacks and the triggers and when you know, what helps you when you have panic attacks? Um well, I think one of the biggest one of the biggest things I've learned is how to recognize triggers. Which is hard to do because um, you don't always know, you you can't predict, you know, what's going to happen. Say you go to a friend's house and they have a movie on that is um, a little more violent in nature or um, there's, you know, gratuitous sex scenes or something. But whatever it is that that kind of sets you off and you're not expecting it. It's it it can be it kind of ca- it can catch you by surprise. Yeah. So um, learning to recognize um, the the sort of things that will trigger that if it's if it's movie scenes if it's um, certain people or um, certain things people do like walking behind you coming up behind you um, you learn to you sort of develop defense mechanisms for that. So for me it was to kind of wait until people walked around me or to warn people about coming up behind me. I have, um, I have a couple friends who have had to do that. And, uh, it's, it's a learning process really. Um, Mm -hmm. it, it does get, it does get easier because you are, 
although uh, the fear is never quite rational uh, in the sense that you can you have control over it and you can completely talk yourself out of it you can you can um challenge yourself to see it in a less dramatic light so say you know you're watching a movie you can say okay this is this is just a movie this is not something that's actually happening they're just making a point it's not going to happen to you you're not playing out the scene and so by i've i've really noticed and maybe maybe this is a little crazy but i've noticed that talking to myself and sort of talking myself down really does help i find playing music helps a lot Sometimes um, playing angry music, it just kind of leeches, leeches that those dark thoughts out of me. Sometimes mm-hmm. playing happy music puts me in a better mood. And uh, overall, though, I'd say writing is, has is really what has um, has helped me through it the most. When I'm when I'm in when I'm having an episode, yeah, when I'm able to when I'm not shaking and I'm able to write, I find free writing about what I'm feeling can help because for me, uh, writing literally takes takes what I'm feeling out of me and puts it on a page. So it's like I'm I'm putting it away, I'm putting it in a drawer. And um that's that's become quite helpful as I'm as I'm dealing with this. Hmm. Now, interestingly, travel has helped you as well, right? Yes, it has. And and that is that probably seems counterintuitive to a lot of people who have PTSD. Right. As as someone who really loved growing up between different cultures, who um really loved the the freedom to travel, which is what led me to a freelance career. Um the freedom to meet new people, experience new cultures, see new things. It really, PTSD really kicked my ass as far as that goes, because <laughs> just not being able to leave the house was so depressing. And and it kind of made, it made me worse knowing that I had this fear that I couldn't really control and it was preventing me to from doing the things that I loved. So what I ended up doing uh, this was uh, late 2014. It was August to October, or was it November uh, 2014? I decided to take a trip, uh, an extended trip by myself. It was the second time I was traveling alone for a period of a few months. I had gone once during college, and I really wanted to see what I could do to move past this fear. And so I planned a trip. I ended up going to uh, back to Britain. I w- and I went to France for a couple weeks. I met up with some friends there. I went to England and Scotland and Wales. And um, I hitchhiked uh, rather unexpectedly. That wasn't really part of the plan. But it ended up being a lot less of a scary experience that I was expecting. I met strange people on public transportation. I stayed with friends I had, hadn't had seen in years. I, I met new friends. And I really did find that that was very helpful. And it did, there were, there were some, there were some tough moments, you know, traveling by yourself in the middle of the night in, uh, in unknown places. That does have, uh, that, that can be traumatic on its own, even if you don't have a, a pre-existing condition. Mm-hmm. But it was something I, I took moment by moment, and I found so much comfort in in being able to enjoy travel again and to and to uh, experience that that wonder and that uh, that freedom again. I think that really motivated me to to fight PTSD in my daily life. So, so that I could continue to make travel a part of my lifestyle. And I think it'll always be there to some extent. I'll always be a little more wary, a little more concerned about where I'm going and what I'm doing at certain times. I'll probably be less likely to go clubbing, say, um, in the middle of Europe. But those, those experiences with, with people uh, ending up in unexpected places, I think those are invaluable especially especially with people who 
who suffer from anxiety-related issues and the after-effects of trauma, I really do believe travel is, is one of the best one of the best gifts you can give to yourself, even if it is difficult. Mm. Yeah, it, it's a gift I gave to myself, actually. Um, right before I went to grad school, and right before I was also going to be moving uh, away from home for the first time, and I went off to Europe by myself. Uh, I was meeting up with a, a tour group, but I didn't know anybody. And I went for two and a half weeks, and it was the most terrifying, but like completely empowering experience that I've ever had in my life. And, um, and it, it really helped me to feel more independent and more confident in myself and, and in my abilities to, you know, to take care of myself and to be alone. So I don't know if it's for everyone, but yeah, it, it's definitely such can be such an amazing experience. So I, I totally, I totally understand where you're coming from with it. Uh, yeah, I like what you said about uh, travel as as empowering, and I think that's very true. Now, don't get me wrong. I I'm notorious for getting lost and being scatterbrained. I often lose things that are very important, like chargers and tickets, and I have a unfortunate propensity to miss planes, trains, and buses on the regular. <laughs> but but I found that in a way, that is also helpful to me at least. Don't get me wrong. It can it can definitely trigger panic attacks for no reason other than I really should have just checked the schedule and um no not even PTSD related panic attacks, just pure why did you do this, Leanna? Panic attack. Yeah. <laughs> but um I find I find that I, I I can be more at peace abroad uh, when I, when I'm not. Maybe it's related to how I identify as someone other than American. Maybe it's because I've just I've just traveled to the point where home is everywhere. I'm really not sure. But the fact that I was assaulted so close to my own home did did really speak to how I ended up feeling while traveling. I, I did actually feel safer in different in a different country uh, because I just, uh, I, I've learned to be comfortable basically ev anywhere. And I, I found that to be very true uh, as I, as I traveled and as I sort of negotiated in these different places. And when I inevitably ended up in a situation, for instance, when I was in Scotland, I uh, through no this was the, one of these one of the few times it was through no fault of my own I ended up missing several connections because of an accident on the road and I was stuck in the highlands with a bunch of people from my coach and we were stuck just uh by this little roadside cafe drinking tea because we had nowhere else to go there was that was the only road there was an accident and we were just going to have to turn around and go back the other way and at first, you know, I sort of ra I sort of raged against the system and I shook my fist at the sky and, you know, God, why can't I just get this right for once, please? And so I had those moments, but then eventually I just I just had to accept that this this was what it was and I sort of calmed down and I I started talking to people and I I kind of just sort of laughed and shrugged my shoulders and, and sort of gave up control. And when you have PTSD, control is a huge, huge issue. You need to control, often control where you're going, what you're doing. Uh, if it's extreme, you have to control every detail of every day. And when you're not in control, that is the moment when you, you tend to have, uh, you tend to fall into a trigger, have a panic attack. And I'm learning that with travel, Control is something that you just, you can't really ever, um, you can't really ever expect. The thing, the thing is that, right, like, travel is unpredictable. It really is. Travel is very unpredictable. You can never control every detail of every day that you travel. Itineraries, they're great. 
But even even with, you know, a tour company or a group of friends who have a set itinerary, things, unexpected things will happen. You will lose your friends in a crowd. You will um, run into accidents. You will end up missing planes, trains, and buses. You will lose that phone charger that connects you to the outside world. Things like that will happen. And, you know, for people without any kind of anxiety issues, this is also a problem because we like to be in control. But one of the biggest things that travel will teach you is that that is impossible. And I think that's helpful for people with PTSD and with anxiety issues because it kind of it really teaches you that you don't have to be in control all the time, that that um, you just you have to learn to take life as it comes Mm -hmm. And for me, for me at least, that's a comfort. For other people, it might not be, and I understand yeah. that because that is <laughs> that is part of the condition. But yeah. for me, it is comforting that um, also being a Christian, um, control is also something we struggle with. And because I believe that there is someone higher than me in control of my life, that that also plays into it, and that can be a huge comfort as well. So uh, between between travel and between trying to negotiate my faith when I'm in a back road of some village somewhere with no idea where I'm going, it does it it does it can be panic it, it can lend itself to panic attacks. It can be scary, but but in the end, uh, it, it is it is comforting in a way knowing that whatever happens will happen, and that I all I can do is control how I'm going to react to it, each situation as it comes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I think travel helps to give us skills that we don't have going into it. Um, and especially for someone who is coming from a trauma background, you know, yeah, that can be really scary and that can lead to anxiety and panic attacks. Mm. Um, and, and I, I, I struggled a lot when I first went on my trip. You know, I was feeling anxious. I was feeling homesick and it was, it was a struggle, but I was able to push myself through it because it was something that I really wanted to do and I knew it was going to be helpful to me and it was really important to me. And, and being able to do that and to get myself through it, you know, to the point where by the end of the trip, I mean, I was having a great time and, mm. you know, I, I wasn't terribly anxious to come home. Um, <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> but um, but it helped to teach me that I could do it, that I could be in a situation like that and I could, I could be okay and I could get through it. And, yeah, I think it just – it helps to make you a stronger person. I agree. I definitely agree. Travel, uh, I could talk forever about how beneficial <laughs> travel is. I really do think it, it, it may not be a cure-all, but uh, it opens up your mind to a completely different world. It, it helps you with survival skills. It helps you um, sort of find, find peace in places uh, outside, of your comfort, in, uh, outside of your comfort zone. And it really does teach you uh, about a bigger world and and that control is not something that you necessarily need. But at the same time, if you are stuck in a situation that you're not expecting, you can you can um, you can show grace under pressure and you can uh, react to it in a way that is healthy and that is helpful for everyone around you. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's really amazing what travel can do for us and and how it can help us. So, Leanna, how would you say that you're doing today overall? Well, that's an interesting question, Melissa, because um I'm this this year is going to be interesting for me, and I'll tell you why. In the past year, I I've uh left my family's house for the first uh well, not the first time, but um uh, through difficult the first time through difficult circumstances i started a new relationship and i also got pregnant and the interesting thing about being pregnant while you have ptsd at least for me is that one tends in my case one kind of canceled the other out so because i was so um 
so anxious about the pregnancy and what was going to happen with that, my PTSD triggers actually faded away. So I'm not dealing with any PTSD-related panic attacks at the moment. Oh, that's interesting. It is very interesting. And I'm a little concerned what's going to happen about what's going to happen after um, I have the baby and after all that is over, I have no way of knowing if if that's something that I've just I've just sort of moved on and I've mm. come to terms with my trauma because I it has thankfully not having the panic attacks. It has kind of allowed me to look at it and uh, a lot more calmly and a lot more logically and, and kind of uh, talk my talk to myself about how I, I'm a survivor and I'm not a victim. So I. I am grateful for for the reprieve, I suppose. But this this year, 2016, it's it's kind of a question mark because I'm not sure I'm not sure where I'm going. I'm you know I'm just starting my own business. I've got uh, I've got a family to think about, and I'm not really sure what this means in terms of PTSD. However. Because of the pregnancy, uh, because of family situations, and because of the PTSD, I really decided that I needed more help than I was getting previously. So I'm lucky to be in a supportive relationship. I'm lucky to have a good support system. Um, I'm lucky to have started my own business. And I think all of those things have really set me up for um, for a much healthier future. So... Although I'm not sure what I'm going to be facing this year or the next year or you know any any time after that, I do believe that um, I am recognizing that I need help and that I am putting my effort into getting those resources together. And I think that's that's probably the most important lesson I've learned in the past few years dealing with trauma is that you you need help. You really do. Just telling yourself you don't is a lie. <laughs> Mm hmm. Yeah, it can take us a while to get to that point, you know, to realize that and then actually go get the help. That's true. That's true. but sometimes the realization yeah. and getting the help come happen very separately. Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I can say that from experience. Mm. Um, but yeah, so that that's interesting. Now, are you are you doing anything right now to kind of prepare yourself? for when you have your baby and, you know, so that you don't, uh, you know, start having PTSD symptoms again? Or do you feel like it's something that you can't really control and you just have to deal with it as it happens? A little of both. I think it's important to put kind of systems in place. So I am, I do have a counselor that I see. Um, I will be also looking into... Uh, probably more professional help as well, getting someone I can talk to, a uh, professional psychologist probably uh, maybe once a week or, or a couple times a month, and uh, really just trying to put systems in place that I know were healthy, like, you know, working on my business, that's a, that's a very healthy outlet for me, you know, uh, forcing myself to interact with the outside world like going back and I used to be an avid dancer and I've let that go for several reasons in the past couple of years I want to get back into that not only for health reasons but for that social aspect you know um, I tend to be a bit more of an introvert as a writer as a PTSD survivor that tends to be the path you uh, you go down so uh, that's that just recognizing what my weaknesses are in terms of socializing, in terms of needing that professional help, um, getting help for my business is also something that I've I've worked on because stress can can really trigger a lot of anxiety. Um, it, whether you have PTSD or you deal with depression or you have other anxiety related conditions, stress is not helpful. <laughs> so. Rec yeah, and there can be a lot of stress in, in a business. Exactly. <laughs> recognizing that, recognizing my weaknesses, what I can and cannot do, and then outsourcing those to people who are much better at that than I am, that really is, uh, that's really been helpful in, in keeping my stress levels low. 
and also listening to the people around me. I think that's a big thing is that, you know, people will, you know, you look, you look tired today or I, I, I think you should, I think you should put down your pen for a while or shut your computer off and uh, listening, listening to the people around me who care about me and who know what I'm going through. That's something that I'm, I'm having to learn as well. So it's, it's very encouraging to see these things and to recognize these things don't get me wrong, acting on them, as, as we've already said, that's a whole, other, it's a whole other story and it can be a whole other battle. But recognizing them and knowing that they're important is, is a pretty big step towards recovery, I think. And so I'm, for the most part, I'm pretty confident. I may not know what, I'm, what, what kind of storms I'm in for or I'm headed towards, but I think I'm, I'm really getting to a good, solid point in my life where I can... I can face them and I can overcome them and hopefully go right back to travel as soon as as soon as I can scrape the money together. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you if travel was in your future plans. Oh, absolutely. I mean, even throughout the pregnancy, I um, well, that let me see. I was in Boston for a conference last year. That was before I got pregnant, but I even after. Even after knowing about the baby, I, I road trip to uh, uh, across states. I um, I went to visit some family in, in California and in Texas, and I just I can't stay away from it. I have to travel, even if it's locally. So I, mm-hmm. I have a lot of I have a lot of different ideas for this year. I'd love to go to Iceland. I'd love to go to Ireland. I'd love to, um, well, India is a huge, a huge goal of mine. That'll probably have to wait for a little while, but I'm determined to, to get at least one trip in this year. And I don't feel like I have an excuse now that I, I'm starting that business. Um, if I can be fully location independent, full-time freelancer by the end of the year, then, then I will have really, really reached a, a big goal. Yeah, that's, that's great. And I love how you have those goals for yourself. You know, a lot of, a lot of times we don't, we don't take the time to, to set those goals or to think about where we want things to head in the future. And we're just, mm. you know, a little too focused on, on just where we're at in the moment. And then we get stuck there mm. and we have a hard time moving forward because of that. So yeah, I love how you have those plans for yourself. And yeah, even though you can't predict everything that's going to happen, um, there's still things you can do to prepare yourself and, mm-hmm. and to put yourself in, in the best position possible for when unexpected things do occur. Mm. So, Leanna, tell us uh, a little more about the business that you have and, and everything that you have going on today. Yeah, Melissa. Uh, so, I like I said before, I'm a freelance journalist. And for me, that means telling stories, telling other people's stories and sort of searching out my own in a, in a couple different media, um, I'm a writer first and foremost, but I have done photography and video, and I love it. I love being able to tell a story in different ways, but writing is my, I would say, is my first passion. And I always wanted to start my own business. Uh, I just launched uh, this past month in February. It's called Lost Lass, which kind of speaks to my... Uh, speaks to a lot of what I believe about travel, um, speaks to my multicultural background. And it's uh, it's kind of, it's become my personal brand, really. And so I'm focused on, on copywriting. I do uh, ghostwriting for companies, for blogs, for anyone um, in business who kind of needs that help, that extra help getting their names out there and talking about their products and services. That's one thing I love to do. And then being a journalist, I'm fascinated by um, current events, by cultural um, things happening in different countries, different cultures, uh, social justice, shows, um, religious justice, and uh, travel, of course, as well. I love writing about travel. So I'm I'm in the, it's still in the early stages. I'm trying to uh, you know, I'm pitching a lot of magazines at this point, a lot of newspapers, a lot of different publications, and um, just trying to get the word out there, uh, setting up my website, which is also a challenge of its own, <laughs> and uh, just 
just kind of figuring out what I want, what, what my goals are for this business and where I want to end up. And, uh, that's, it's really, it, it's definitely not easy. And I knew going into freelancing that it would be a challenge and that I would have to be very self-motivated. And luckily as a former homeschooler, I do have that kind of self-motivation, mm. uh, which, uh, which is, is unique. I think not, not too many people who have gone to school all their lives have quite the same motivation as a homeschooler who could just mess around all day, but, but can, can sit themselves down and get work done. So I'm, I'm lucky as far as that goes. My, I tend to I tend to work too much as opposed to too little. So that's that's my challenge at the moment. But it's early days yet and I'm still kind of trying to set things up and feel my way around. So perhaps I can be forgiven for pulling long hours. <laughs> yeah, I, it's so easy to do that when you get started. You know, I, over time you'll probably scale back a little bit or I hope so or uh or or be able to have other people helping you out as well so um but yeah I mean congratulations on on getting your business started thank you and I hope it it goes well for you so uh, I want to ask you the final question that I have for you today Mm. and that is given what you know now if you could go back to when you were going through your tough times and give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Get help. Definitely, definitely get help. Because as I, you know, the one thing that I, I probably didn't stress as much as I was telling my story is that throughout that, you know, I talk about, I talk about the past. It, hindsight is twenty twenty. I talk. I can. I can look at the past and I can see. Okay, my PTSD didn't develop until about a year in, and then this happened, and then I had these symptoms, and then this happened again, and so I. I can see it all pretty well from this point of view. Obviously, it felt different going through it at the time, but the one thing that was missing throughout that entire two and a half, three year experience, sort of coming up to where I am now, is professional help. Uh, you know, when the first year when I just didn't sort of react at all, I didn't feel like I needed it. I thought, oh, you know, I've, I know some people get PTSD, but I probably didn't. I think I've just sort of moved past it, which is a clear mistake. And then as the symptoms developed, I, I just put it off or I believed I could handle it myself or because I was dealing with depression and, and other PTSD related symptoms that kind of deterred me from wanting to talk to anyone else about it. So for one reason or another, I just did not get the help I needed. And it took, it took several years. It took a new relationship and a pregnancy to finally tell myself, okay, I really, really need to do this. And this is happening. So for the, this is the, the first sort of a first for me. And so I beg you all, please, even if you don't think you need it, even if um, you think you'll be fine, even if the idea just scares you, just scares the shit out of you, excuse my French, even if the idea just scares you completely and you can't deal with the thought of having to open up, please just try And you you don't have to spill your guts the first day. It's just having someone who knows what they're doing, who can help you be accountable in the day to day is really, really important. And um, I think that and that's true of your business as well. If you are whether it's career, whether you have a solid career in a in a sit down job that has regular hours or you're more of an entrepreneur you can de-stress, you can, um, you can find ways to manage stress by getting, by getting help from your friends, by getting help from those at work if you find your job very stressful. And I promise that will really help with, with your PTSD symptoms. So yeah, get help is <laughs> that's the biggest lesson I've learned and it's the biggest one I, I, I think I should pass on. Mm. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You know, it took me a while from the time I realized I needed it until the time I went to get it. Mm. And at least for myself, I was just, 
probably being a little stubborn and, you know, I was trying to, to take care of it myself. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> I, I realized soon enough that I couldn't do that and, and I needed to get that professional help and just help me, you know, really, really get on that path to healing, you know. Unfortunately, we can't be both patients and doctors. That's just, that's not really how it works. Exactly. I wish, but no. <laughs> yeah. So definitely great advice. And before I uh, let you go, Liana, uh, how can people connect with you? And um, I know your website is lostlass.com, right? Yeah, you can also, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. I spend most of my day on Facebook, actually. Um, so uh, you can find me at Lost Lass. I have a Facebook page. And then Twitter, I'm at Leanna Lost. So please uh, check me out there. You can also probably search me on LinkedIn if you're at all interested in that kind of thing. I don't, I find LinkedIn pretty boring, but I think it's a good platform as a journalist, so I'm trying but yeah, please um, connect with me at Facebook, Twitter. I, I'm really fascinated by um, uh, mental health issues. I've I've been uh, trying to continue a blog series I started about um, about uh, PTSD and travel called "Traveling with Trauma." So I would love to hear your story if you'd love to con if you'd like to contribute to that. I'm hoping to um, sort of sort of kick it back into gear later this year. And, uh, or if you're just interested in journalism or entrepreneurship, I'd love to hear from you as well. So please connect with me, check out my website, uh, check out what I do. I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, sounds good. And I will have your links on your show notes page. Great. So, yeah. So I just, I just want to thank you for coming on here and for sharing your story with us today. And, you know, I, I love how we talked a little bit about travel and how, helpful that can be because I, I definitely have experienced that myself. And yeah, and just, you know, getting your perspective on dealing with PTSD. Um, I think this is, you know, going to be helpful for those listening. So thank you for that. Thank you, Melissa. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, I, it was, it was great to have you on and I hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the show today. This has been the Grass Gets Greener podcast, episode 68. Go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash Leanna Johnson to find the links mentioned during this episode or to leave a comment. So I hope you enjoy this episode and that you were able to relate to it, especially if you're someone who is dealing with PTSD. One of the things that I want to reiterate here is how important it is to get that help sooner rather than later, as we were talking about. Now, I know that sometimes that's not always easy or even possible. You know, it took me five years to actually talk about what I had been through and then a few more years to go and get professional help. But if I could go back and do things differently, I mean, that is the one thing that I would do differently because it wasn't until then that I was really able to begin on my healing journey and start down the path that's led me to where I am today. And then, of course, as was the case for Leanna, she ended up developing PTSD a year later because she thought that she was fine. And then, you know, all of a sudden she started to experience those symptoms. So if you're in a position where you can get that help sooner rather than later, then that is what I would definitely recommend. And, you know, I would also love to hear from you if you've uh, experienced any benefits from travel, if that's something that you have tried, and if it has helped you in any way. I'm sure Leanna would love to hear about that as well. So feel free to reach out and let us know. You know, you can leave a comment over on the show notes page or reach out to Leanna or myself individually and yeah, just let us know. We would love to hear about that and, and connect with you on that. And come back next week to listen to Lisa Floyd, who was adopted when she was a baby. And she's going to talk with us about how that was a traumatic experience for her. And honestly, it was quite eye-opening for me to hear about it. 
and to hear about the ways in which someone who's been adopted can be affected in their life and in ways very similar to those of us who've been abused in some way. So that was really interesting and I'm looking forward to sharing that. And we're actually going to be doing a couple of episodes on that topic. And that'll be starting out again next week with Lisa Floyd. And just want to remind you that if you're interested in getting that free audiobook download along with the 30-day free trial from audible.com, all you have to do is go to thegrassgetsgreener.com forward slash audible. And of course, don't forget to head over to iTunes or Stitcher to leave the show a rating and review so that we can reach as many survivors as possible. And as always, have hope. Have hope.